All right. You ready to record this, Michael Let's go. Wolf? Let's do it. Oh, and Michael Wolf, host of the Next Market Podcast. Is that good? Or do you want me to introduce you in a different way? Um, that works. Yeah. yeah. I'll say whatever you want. That works for me, man. All right. Cool. Actually, cool. host of the Smart Home Show podcast. Okay. Yeah, sure. The Smart Home Show podcast. Done. Here we go. Daily Tech News Show is brought to you by me. Oh, thanks, me. If you also wish to bring it, go to patreon.com slash acedetect. That's patreon.com slash A-C-E-D-T-E-C-T. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 17th, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, Michael Wolf, host of the Smart Home Show podcast. You've probably seen his work all over the internet, Forbes and GigaOM and next market and all kinds of places michael good to have you back on the show hey thanks for having me tom thank you uh i know you're an android phone user and an ipad user and you're married into an iphone user uh so it'll be interesting to to talk a little bit about the reviews for iphone 6 and ios 8 uh, which i i took the hour today to update we'll talk about that in a little while as well as you've got some interesting insights on apple watch and what some of the uh some of the reservations might be around that yeah, I, I think I wrote a report for it at Gigom. We did a flash survey of some readers, and what they said kind of corresponds with I, what I've been thinking about. We'll save that for later in the show. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that in a bit. Let's start off with the headlines. Uh, do you feel that? That's the feeling of almost an entire week of factual coverage of Apple products coming to an end. As iOS 8 rolls out today for everybody, the iPhone 6 reviews have all been posted, and people familiar with the matter have wasted no time uh, slipping out the latest Apple rumor. The Daily Dot is the vector this time, stating that Apple will announce two new iPads and launch iOS 10 Yosemite on October 21st. Using our imagination is just so much more fun than talking about facts, Tom. <laughs> right. It got so boring. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like, but we, we're going to see that phone in reality. Let's make, some, let's make some stuff up. That's no good. Actually, usually these dates that, that get thrown out there end up being true. Uh, but I like to emphasize to people, Apple has not announced anything yet when this sort of thing happens. GigaOM reports BitTorrent opened up the alpha test of its secure messaging app Bleep on Wednesday. Uh, apps for OS X and Android were released, as well as an update for the existing Windows client. Bleep offers end-to-end -end encryption for instant messaging, as well as a number of other features that help make it difficult to determine which users are actually communicating with each other. Anybody concerned about metadata analysis would want that kind of shielding as well. I don't know if you've heard much about Bleep, Michael. I haven't heard anything until today. That's why I decided to be on the show, so I'd be informed about this. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of been uh, bubbling under the radar, especially because they only had the one client. But hopefully now that it's out there for Android, we'll see more people using it. One of the impediments to its effectiveness is the fact that it needs more people using it to be able to obscure your metadata better. And so they're talking about, this is an alpha client right now, but they're talking about eventually plugging it into the wider BitTorrent system so that even if only a couple people are using it at the beginning, it would still be able to mask itself amongst all that traffic. It's a really interesting project uh, and open source. Interesting. The Verge reports Logitech announced the Harmony Living Home line of remotes. The three new models have more intuitive software to help you control certain brands of connected thermostats, light bulbs, blinds, smart locks, and of course your home theater. The remotes start at $99 and range up to $349 for the ultimate home remote. That's the one with a 2.4 inch display. It also allows you to customize experiences uh, to occur when you wake up or when an in-law is yelling at you. Wait, you know, I, I they also introduced was, but... it with a hub, which includes Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi. And it, I think it's interesting. There, there's so many hubs out there now for the smart home. But where I think Logitech really does have uh, an entry point and differentiator is, you know, they have such a huge install base around the remotes. Um, and that is kind of a differentiator, kind of being tied to their remote. Yeah, I, I loved it when they added the home to the home theater remote. I have the Logitech Harmony Ultimate, which doesn't have the home automation stuff in it. But it makes a world of difference. I don't have to sit there pointing the remote at all of my machines for 30 seconds while it cycles through all this stuff. Because these, these experiences that we're talking about here, like, like uh, you know, wake up, are, the, are similar to the kinds of things when I say, like, watch TV. It turns on the television, turns on the set-top box, turns on the speakers. 
Uh, it's just that that same sort of thing. So it's kind of natural for them to expand that and say, hey, we already had a hub for that kind of stuff. Let's make a hub for the home automation as well. Yeah, and I should note that they did also have an add-on that adds Z-Wave and Zigbee. So I know that a lot of people who have smart home have those mm -hmm. technologies. So they're also doing that, but if they're doing an add-on. You basically have to pay extra, I think 100 bucks or so to get Ooh. those radios. That's a little pricey. But at least it's there. Yeah, uh, it's, it's there. A, the more interoperable, closer we get to some kind of interoperability, the better. According to Reuters, the online review site Yelp and mobile app developer TinyCo have both agreed to settle separate charges that they improperly collected children's information online under the Child Online Protection Act. Yelp will pay a $450,000 civil penalty, penalty for collecting name, email, and location information from children under 13 without parental consent. TinyCo will pay $300,000 for targeting young children with brightly colored characters in apps, which also collected email addresses from children. It's almost like the Joe Camel of the digital age. Yeah, all they needed was like maybe like a mascot, like a, like a Ronald McDonald or something. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, uh, the Verge reports the Chinese mobile phone company ZTE has a new phablet for sale in the U.S. starting September 24th. I just hate saying phablet. The Z Max is exclusive to T-Mobile, runs on Android 4.4 KitKat, features a 5.7-inch display with 720p resolution, an 8-megapixel camera, quad-core Qualcomm Snapdragon 400 processor, and 16 gigabytes of internal storage. But here's the kicker. The Z Max sells for $252, or about $1050 a month for 24 months. Uh, the Verge says the Z Max isn't a striking phone, but hey, okay. Maybe all we need is a break from all of these big fancy phablets with their chamfered edges and their <laughs> curved whatnots. Go simple with the Z Max. 252 bucks too. Not bad. Pretty yeah. powerful. Yeah, not bad for the money at all for that power. Time for some news from you. These are things submitted at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. If you are not in there, uh, get in there. There's a ton of people from the audience going in there, submitting stories, which you're welcome to do, or even if you just want to vote on the stories that are in there, let me know what you're interested in hearing on the show. It really helps me put it together every day. Captain Kipper pointed out the NASA post that the U.S. Space Agency has granted contracts to Boeing and SpaceX to carry crews into space. Each contractor will conduct manned test missions to gain certification. Then they'll be on the hook to carry out two to six crewed missions to the ISS. And it turns out Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin sneaked in a little on Boeing's money. United Launch Alliance, which is a joint venture of Boeing and Lockheed, is going to team up with Blue Origin to build the rockets and capsules. ULA will build the capsules. Blue Origin will build the BE-4 rockets to launch them. Uh, the goal of all of this, NASA's program, is to end reliance on Russia for delivering crew to the ISS by 2017. I think they paid uh, Boeing $2.5 billion. The government awarded them $2.5 billion, or roughly one Minecraft. <laughs> Just, Bojang. Really? They only got, oh no, SpaceX got one Minecraft. Boeing got almost two Minecrafts. Uh, okay. It looks like Boeing okay. has it. Well, it, it's one of those weird government things. A maximum potential value of the contract okay. is $4.2 billion for Boeing. Or maybe we should say Microsoft SpaceX. paid space money for Boeing. <laughs> yeah. And you were pointing out previously, uh, Sony had some bad news. They, they lost a, a space money. They lost space one money. unit of space money, uh, $2 billion on phones. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, the Coralie posted an R&D mag story that researchers at the University of Missouri... Mizzou, have created a long-lasting, efficient nuclear battery that could be used in automobiles and even possibly in space flight, as described in research published in the journal Nature. Uh, don't let the nuclear part of this scare you. Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Nuclear Engineering Jay Kwan says this is similar to technology already used in fire detectors and exit signs. The battery uses strontium-90 in a water-based solution with a titanium dioxide electrode. In other words, it's a liquid, it doesn't freeze easily, and it puts out efficient electricity. Um, years from practicality, who knows? But that that could be interesting if we had nuclear-powered cars from strontium batteries. You want a strontium car? Uh, I'll take one of those. Though. I want one in my house. As long as it, like we all don't get radiated and our, our kids don't get right. three yes. eyes. I'm good with it. You say nuclear and people just kind of lose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Uh, Metal Freak and Digs a lot both noticed articles on the Cosmos browser, which transfers data over SMS. I was looking at the Mucked article that uh, Metal Freak submitted. This is very useful for users who can't afford a phone with a data plan. Developer Stefan Alexic of Cold or of Cold Sauce developed the text-only browser, which texts URLs to a Twilio number, which then forwards it to a Node.js service that gets the HTML, strips it of everything but the text. So it gets rid of all the images and the scripts and everything, compresses that text, and sends it along as a series of SMS messages. The browser then receives the messages, decompresses them, and displays the text as a single page. The code is open source and targeted at Android devices. If you want to find out more about it, look for the Cosmos browser from Cold Sauce on GitHub. Interesting. And know Twilio is a private, a commercial service, so you wonder if somewhere along the value chain there, Someone can shut that off, even though it's open source. Yeah, I, I, you got to be on a message plan that can handle that amount of messages. Uh, most of these uh, places that don't that rely on feature phones more often usually have free incoming text messages. So that that mm -hmm. could cause some some carriers to start to review that policy of allowing free incoming messages. I suppose, but um, but somebody's going to be paying for them. So. The, the Node.js service, whoever's running that's going to have to pay for them. It's clever, though. It's really clever. Yeah, I love the innovation, especially as it brings uh, more understanding and knowledge to people who can't afford it. Yeah, absolutely. So good stuff. Good good job, Cold Sauce and Stefan Alexic. And that is a look at the headlines. Uh, real quickly, I know I've been talking about it all week for those who, who listen closely every day, but I want to remind folks, I can't. I wrote a novella. It's a, uh, it's a mystery called Events of a Different Nature. Two private investigators who may or may not be dogs, uh, they never admit it, are in a neighborhood in Northern California trying to fight crime and make the world a better place. Uh, it's, it's short. It's only 120 pages, and you can get a free version if you just want to try it out. I've also got print versions, eBooks for Kindle and all of that. Check it out, TomMerrittBooks.com. Let me know what you think. Uh, I had a lot of fun writing it. So. I'll blurb it. Want me to blurb it? Yeah, if you would, that'd be great. <laughs> I'd, I'd be honored if you blurbed it. That's All right. Uh, let's talk about Apple Watch. Uh, so you were mentioning uh, at the beginning of the show that, that you did, a, you call it a flash, right? A flash analysis? We did a, a really quick survey of gig at home readers. And with all the disclaimers that that entails, knowing these are readers of a blog, they're, they're tech savvy, and they're generally, you know, gig home has a lot of Apple fans because they used to have a, the Apple blog. So sure. all that to say, we did a survey about 100 of them to get the initial reaction. And I wrote a report about it for GigaOM, as well as kind of weaved in some of my own analysis. I've looked quite a lot at the smartwatch market. So it, it, what was interesting is one of the one of the things I would say is it, it did really well. They kind of they sang to the choir. People loved it, and they, so they didn't they didn't with the Apple Watch upset anyone. I guess they didn't people didn't come out of there going this is a terrible. It's, we're disappointed. But when we asked them about what they think the hurdles will be, um, the I thought it would be price. I mean, it's 350 bucks. It seemed a little pricey, right? Yeah. But Especially because you know it's going to be $1,000 for some of those models that they talked about. 350 yeah, exactly. is the cheapest. The gold yeah. bling model for, for 100 or for 1000 with the gold on it. But but that wasn't the biggest concern with regards to will this thing succeed? What was the biggest concern broadly when people kind of stepped out and looked at it was the fact that you essentially needed an iPhone. It re was required to essentially make this thing work. And I get why they did it. Apple would basically have to do that, but it does kind of re raise the total cost of ownership for people and basically go from $350 to the fact that you have to have a data plan. It's really hobbled without it. And so that's what people really saw as kind of a showstopper in terms of how widely this thing gets adopted and what could limit adoption. Now, when you say they had to do that, do you mean they had to do that because there are functions you just can't pack into the watch? Or do you mean they had to do that because they need to boost the iPhone sales or both? I think that to work to to make a standalone smartwatch that can communicate without a, an iPhone is hard to do because you probably have to pack in LTE or some form of cellular radio. But I think when I may say they had to, I, I mean more that they they really wanted to pe people people to view this as an add-on to an iPhone and kind of part of the broader iPhone universe rather than be something that is standalone and, and independent of it. And so that's really what I think they did. And I, I understand why they did it because. Um, they want people to come back and, and have their life revolve around iOS devices, around iPhone, and I would do the same exact thing. 
Um, but at the same time, they're really limiting the total potential sales. I, they could potentially double their sales if this thing, for example, worked with Android phones. Is it the kind of thing where I want to? I'm trying to compare it to previous Apple products, right? The iPod came out; it was only for Mac at first, and then eventually they came out with a version that you could use with Windows. Uh, same with the iTunes Store. Uh, iPad came out, you could use, you could use sync it with anything because they already had iTunes, but that was because the infrastructure was already built there. They do this sometimes where they come out with a, a device and they say, well, it's only going to work in our own universe for now, but sometimes they adapt to realities. I don't see them ever coming up with an Android app that would sync with the Apple Watch, but do you think down the road we see an Apple Watch that could be better with an iPhone, but still be totally usable with that one. I mean, this one can do some things without the iPhone, but it's very limited. I think over time they could expand the family, and I think what's more likely is to create a standalone smartwatch that didn't necessarily require uh, an iPhone to live and breathe and, and be of high value. Um, didn't necessarily have to be a parasite, <laughs> as they call it. Um, I can see that. I don't know if they'll ever create a, an, uh, an Apple Watch that worked with an Android phone. I just don't see them doing that. Yeah, I don't either. But creating a standalone Apple Watch, I think that could be in the cards down the road. Yeah, and especially as uh, data becomes more pervasive, chips become smaller, even for yep. things like LTE modems. If you can, if you can affordably pack a 3G modem into that watch, they'll do it. Uh, it's just a matter of when. Yeah, and let's be honest. This is their first toe in the water of of, of, wear, of wearables, they're really, like most of us, trying to see where this thing is going to go. And I think they're going to learn a lot over the next few years. I mean, no one really knew exactly how fast and furious the, the tablet market would grow. Is Remember 2010, you know, the predictions for the, the iPad were, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, they'll sell $2 million, two, two million iPads first year. They sold about $15 million. Yeah. But that, I think that probably even exceeded their expectations. But that shows you how variable... Um, the sales could be, and really, we don't know what this is going to do, um, and I think they're waiting to see what happens first. I tell you what, man, I've been all over the place trying to predict stuff. Apple TV, I was really excited about. I bought one the minute it was announced, and it was much sl more sluggish than I expected. Uh, iPad, I thought would do okay, a little better than most people, but I, I didn't predict the 15 million, no, like like no one else. You know, I I was shocked at that as well. This one I'm looking at and I'm like, I just don't see this taking off, but I could be wrong. It could be the thing that blazes the trail. But just, you know, just to be clear, this is no different than when Samsung put out the Galaxy Gear. It has a lot of the same criticisms like, oh, I have to buy a Samsung Galaxy phone to use it. And it's limited in what it can do. And it's a little bit expensive. So it's Apple hasn't done something, in my opinion, that changes the game other than that interface. I think... Uh, I hate that they call it a digital crown. Just call it a, a scroll wheel. Or, or it doesn't feel as nearly as rushed. I mean, I feel like yeah. it came out a year, a full year after the Galaxy Gear. Um, I feel like there's some platform integration there that is really going to be hard and gives them mm -hmm. some real um, unfair advantages, to use business school terms, relative to others. Apple Pay integration, HealthKit integration, HomeKit integration. You know, they've been laying the foundation there. It took them, you know, they announced that all at, at WWDC. The, those initiatives yeah. and coming out now with those and this kind of being maybe what they expect to be one of the primary interfaces for those platforms those are some real advantages it'll take a year or two to flesh that out but I think that's huge I don't see those types of advantages for for Samsung especially as they they're just switching they're switching the operating system at the first gen they went to Tizen so clearly um, Samsung was just putting out a piece of hardware Apple's putting on a real platform with a, that ties into their entire ecosystem. So the things you can do with it without having the iPhone connected uh, is it, it can track your steps, right? Because it can't do the GPS stuff, but it can do it can do some fitness tracking. It can play music because it has a certain amount. We don't know how much, but it has yeah. a certain amount of storage on there. Uh, and what am I missing? There's. I think it it, it has BLE in it. It has NFC in it. Um, and I, so I oh, think, Apple Pay. I think you can maybe do Apple Pay. Yeah, without. maybe Apple Pay. I think it's still a little bit unclear what all you can do if the phone isn't on your person. Um, what I'm what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get at is what they should have done is say, it's a credit card, it's a fitness tracker, it's an iPod Nano, it's the Apple Watch. 
And then they add the phone in and say, and if you have a phone, it can do all these other great things as well. All of a sudden, the conversation has changed, right? And everybody's like, oh my God, that's the most amazing watch ever. It can do all these things without even needing a phone. I agree. I think maybe that's for the Super Bowl ad. But hey, we we got to listen to Johnny I with his hypnotic white box. Yeah, <laughs> narrate for, the, for five minutes. So that was great. Uh, real, we, sh- we should also acknowledge, of course, iOS 8 rolling out. Uh, and uh, as always, when there's a new iOS update, uh, there are lots of problems. Uh, it took me about an hour, all told, to get it onto my phone. I made an uncharacteristically wise decision and did not install it on my iPad, which I used to play the music on the show because I wanted to be able to play the music on the show. Uh, so I will add it to the iPad later. My first impression is, when, unlike iOS 7, when you install iOS 8, it is not immediately apparent that you have installed iOS 8. A lot of the changes are not under the hood per se, but they're, they're hidden away. It's not a big you know, visual change from the beginning. Uh, but it, it's working fine. I have an iPhone 5 here that I've got it on, so it's an older phone, and I haven't seen any particular slowdown. Uh, some of the features are nice. I, first thing I did was put SwiftKey on it. That's my favorite Android keyboard, and having it show up on my iPhone was like a revelation. I, I'd never was, I've never been happier about a virtual keyboard. You know, I, I, you're a braver man than I doing that before. But, yeah, like you said, you didn't mess up your, your theme music, so that was important. Yeah, yeah I stayed <laughs> off the iPad. Uh, and you said you were going to probably be called in to, to, to assist. Tech, some tech support later on. Yeah. A lot of people are complaining, especially if you have a smaller capacity iPhone, like a 16 gig, you're going to have to delete things. Uh, if you want to do an over-the-air update. So if you have a smaller iPhone, especially if you have a lot of data on it, it's probably wiser to plug it in and let iTunes download the update and then bring it over to the iPhone rather than having to delete stuff while you cache a copy of it over there. Uh, it's just it's just a sad fact of storage. That 16 gig is not enough to do an, enough. I, an OS update. It's not iPhone 6 reviews coming too. Yeah, TechCrunch's Daryl Etherington uh, says it's the best smartphone for your money. Wall Street Journal's Jeffrey Fowler says the battery died just before the five <laughs> S's. Verge's David Pierce uh, was astonishing. Uh, felt the sensor on the camera is astonishingly fast with autofocus. Uh, Neelay Patel thinks he could use the six plus for almost everything he does: uh, editing docs, watching video, doing messaging. Josh Topolsky over at Business Week uh, thinks it's too big. And Molly Wood, our friend Molly Wood over at the New York Times, says the 6 is a little too small, the 6 Plus is a little too big. Uh, so yeah, they, didn't, they didn't get the size right. I, you know, have you, have you, you had a chance to put your hands on one? I haven't. No, I'm going to go to the Apple store this weekend, mainly because my son is such an Apple fanboy that uh, he'll want to see it. But. Yeah, just, just want to see it in person. Well, I want to hear uh, your reviews audience, uh, any of you who get one this weekend, uh, send us an MP3 or call 512-59-DAILY or just email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Let us know your impressions of iPhone 6, and, and we'll select uh, some representative samples to read on the show. Uh, because these folks who get the iPhone 6 ahead of time are carefully selected. They're not. I don't think they're carefully selected to be fan people. I mean, Molly Wood is not a fan person of the iPhone, but they are carefully selected to be people in the industry that they know, they kind of know how they're going to react. So I'm, I'm always curious to see how just the like general public reacts to these things once they actually are in the wild. Yeah, I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen Walt Osper's review. Um, now, he, he he's a little old school, but man, he, he gives his honest take. And Neelay, Neelay Patel, good luck with using that as your main phone. I hope you're not writing reports on that. I can imagine doing like power work on like a phone. Yeah, I'm absolutely old school. I'm kind of old school that way, I guess. Yeah, he's saying that the iPad could actually become his laptop. I, the fact that you can't do like seven windows at once on an iPad will always keep me from from being able to. We use said that, that about the six plus, the phone. I thought, like he actually said. No, he no, he he yeah, he said the six plus could become his regular thing, and then the iPad would be his oh, laptop that he got used it. sometimes uh, when he needed more, more a little power. more screen, a little more real yeah. estate. Yeah, exactly. Take a look at the calendar. Uh, tomorrow, September 18th, or as we call it around here today, is the next conference in Seoul, Korea, focusing on startups. That's in Korea, they call it today, because it's already there. Uh, also on September 18th, Qualcomm is hosting a mobile developers conference called Uplink with a Q at the end, and earnings will be released for Oracle tomorrow as well. Our pick of the day comes from Andrew Mays. It's called Skyroam. 
He says, you were talking about prepaid SIMs and other international data options. I was doing some research the other day and found a 3G hotspot solution that costs $10 a day for unlimited data and supported in over 40 countries. The service is called Skyroam at skyroam.com. Might be worth taking a look for the data hog on the go. That could end up being pricey on a longer trip, but if you, if you just need it for a few days, uh, that's not bad. Unlimited data, even if it is 10 bucks. And then Derek wrote in and said, I wanted to throw out TEP Wireless, T-E-P, as another option when traveling abroad. They offer 3G mobile hotspots and cover a good portion of the world. I always use it on my trips to Europe, paying about 6 to $7 for 150 megabytes a day. Unused data is rolled over. They can ship it or you can pick it up or drop it off at airports, so it's really convenient. It's a great option if you don't need phone slash SMS and only need data, plus you can attach as many devices as you want to it. That's tepwireless.com. 150 is about what I used when I was traveling, too. So if I was conservative on the first day or two and built up a little pad, I could see that working pretty well. Do, what do you do when you travel abroad, Michael? Well, I always make sure I, I check with my carrier and make sure that I'm not going to kill. But I usually get a plan or kind of a special plan when I go overseas. I don't do a lot of overseas traveling, okay. quite honestly. Yeah. We'll send your picks, folks, to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Finally, our messages of the day. First one is a voicemail from Dominic, uh, still carrying on the conversation about Microsoft's acquisition of Minecraft. Hello, Tom and Jenny. This is Dominic, and I wanted to chime in on the Mohang story. Um, I have a couple concerns about the future of Minecraft, and one of my concerns is obviously what Microsoft buying is what that's going to mean for long-term Linux support, which is how we play that game in our house. And... I don't think Microsoft has a vested interest to continue development for uh, the Linux distributions. Also, I'm concerned that um, the that you only had to buy the game once, and when you only had to buy it once, you know, I've had it for a couple of years now. But as my kids' friends continue to get it, they only when they buy the version that they can play with, you know, the, the the kids can play together. But if I'm concerned that if Microsoft buys it that then they'll turn it into a cycle where a new version of Minecraft would come out every year or two, and then we'd have to go buy new copies of the game without, and then break the back catalog for kids being able to play where they have to always buy the updated version similar to, like, Call of Duty. So that's why my concerns are. I started to drag it out a little long. Thanks for the great show. Hey, thanks, Dominic. Appreciate the, uh, the call. I think a lot of people are afraid of what Microsoft's going to do but I don't think any of us really know what they're going to do. And I personally don't feel they'll do a lot of the things that people are afraid of because it would kill the investment that they have. Microsoft is not nearly as Linux hostile as they used to be. They actually have some Linux products now. So I don't see why they wouldn't continue to develop Minecraft for Linux. What's, what's your take on this acquisition, Michael? Well, I feel like a lot of people still view Microsoft through the lens of like the late 1990s Microsoft when they were all uh, omnipotent and all-powerful and very much trying to get everyone to work in their universe. I don't feel like that's the case anymore. I, I don't feel like they did anything ultra disenfranchising around the Skype acquisition. I feel like they've done a pretty good job with that. I don't think they've seen a ton of people abandon that. I don't. You're totally right with this. I don't think they're going going to basically kill. Uh, the golden goose by cutting off things like Linux that would disenfranchise the community. Yeah, I I think the second point he makes about ooh would they come out with maybe they don't require you to buy a new version of Minecraft but they come out with a Minecraft two that's like a a spin off of it. You know, I think they can make enough money selling packs of things to people and and that's what Mojang has done through this whole thing. It's why they don't charge you for a second copy of Minecraft that they wouldn't have to do that. But that's the kind of thing I'd be more wary of because Microsoft marketing department might say, oh, well, there's no risk. We're not going to take away the other one. Let's put out a second version and see how that goes and try different things. Yeah, might see some yeah. weird stuff like I that. I think Microsoft, like the game studios, the, the Xbox folks, um, try to monetize by trying to pay people to love, you know, pay up for new versions all the time. So I, I would worry about that a little bit. But I feel like I'm sure the Minecraft people had maybe even some stipulations in, in, the, in the acquisition contract that said don't, don't ruin this. <laughs> yeah. Know? Even though Notch is getting out and, and the other guys are getting I feel like they wouldn't necessarily want people to, to ruin what they created. Sam from Maryland writes in and says, I just wanted to write in about the comment Tom made on Monday's show about considering the Moto X over the iPhone 6 
Wanted to make sure you're all aware of the concerns of the new model's battery life, written about here at droidlife.com. As much as I want to recommend a Moto X, it's not great buy if you consider battery life a critical factor for your smartphone. I say this as a diehard Android purist, no hate on Apple. I currently use a Nexus 5, which has the same battery size and similar screen as the new Moto X, and I can never make it wait from wake to bed on a full charge. And I've heard that about the Motorola uh, phones, particularly my wife uh, using a Motorola phone, she was upset the battery charge. That's why they had the Moto Max. But then it, the I, you know, we we heard in those iPhone six reviews that the iPhone six plus has, or the iPhone, I guess it was just the six, not the six plus, uh, didn't have great battery life. But so that that is definitely a factor to take into account. That's why we need the nuclear uh, phone batteries. Nuclear phone. Once, yeah, what's that? Can you imagine <laughs> if that battery technology became? If we ended up with nuclear phone batteries. It's crazy. Uh, and finally, Allison Sheridan, uh, who again I should thank uh, for helping fill in on iPhone announcement day last week, uh, wanted to, to send us a note. She says tonight. She sent it a couple days ago. We took Uber to the beach for dinner and drinks. Both drivers talked to us about Lyft and told us they could give us $30 off our first ride. So I guess they took it there and back. And each time they had a different driver who tried to convert them from Uber to Lyft. So, you know, it's a small data sample, but uh, it looks like maybe Lyft is uh, pushing some drivers who work for both sides to do a little marketing for them. That's smart. It's intriguing. A little yeah. underhanded, but smart. Yeah, well, yeah, they're <laughs> kind of underhanded on all sides in that situation, isn't it? Hey, thanks, Michael Wolf, for joining us. Uh, technology.fm slash The Smart Home Show is one of your newest, it's, is it your newest show, I would imagine? Yeah, it's it's right in my wheelhouse. I've been following The Connected Home since the, the late 90s. I'm an old guy with gray hair, uh, but I've been following it since uh, y, before Wi-Fi was a thing. And, and the, the Smart Home's really taken off. I love talking about it. And, uh, yeah, anyone who's interested in the smart home, uh, have a listen. Check us out. Yeah. I know we have some enthusiasts uh, out there in the audience uh, who are into LifeX bulbs and smart locks and, and, and Zigbee and all of the stuff that you talk about on that show. So definitely check it out, folks. Technology.fm slash the smart home show. And thanks to our 4,281 patrons. Uh, the fact that the number has gone up again just floors me. You guys are the best. I appreciate your faith in the show. It's a, perf it's a perfectly straightforward value for value model. We, I'm going to do the show one way or another. If you find some value in it and you feel you can give some value back, uh, patreon.com slash acedetect is the place to do that. And we really appreciate it. If you're like, eh, I don't really want to do the Patreon thing, dailytechnewsshow.com slash donate has some other options, including some Bitcoin options and some PayPal options. Um, but even if you can't support the show in those kinds of ways, just tell folks about it. Uh, we really appreciate the support the audience has given us. It's amazing. Hey, Tom, can I sneak peek something on, on sure. with regards to Patreon? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm helping Patreon produce a podcast, and they're going to be talking to creators. So, oh, fantastic. Uh, keep an eye out for that. And, uh, Maybe we'll have you on. This I, has happened in real time. You we'll know, I did a you. little. I did a little conversation uh, with Jack Conti and a couple of his VC guys uh, right before they did the announcement, and that was a lot of fun. So I would love to do something like that. Yeah, and we're fo we're focusing in on the creators. The guys are using the platform, and uh, I think it's. I think what they're doing over there is great. And that's why I decided to do it. But uh, yeah, we'll have you on him. I would. That's yeah, great. I would absolutely love to do that. That'd be fun. Cool. I didn't know you were doing that. That's fantastic. Yep. Don't forget, folks, you can have a voice in what stories we cover at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can email us feedback, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Call us, 512-59-DAILY. Listen to the show live at 4.30 Eastern, 1.30 Pacific at mobile.alphageekradio.com. And visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. Tomorrow, whether it's Friday or Thursday where you are, Peter Wells from The Reckoner in Australia will be with us. We'll talk to you then. thump do you always have the thump yeah yeah that's all it yeah, unless i accidentally cut it off but most of the time it's there yeah Splat. i didn't mention the time well i think it'll be on the next couple of weeks uh our first guest was zach wiener smith who from uh saturday morning breakfast or whatever okay he's a, cool. he's a web comic guy but uh oh yeah, yeah that's cool i didn't know i didn't know they were going to do a regular podcast like that i knew jack was wanting to do some stuff like in advance of the uh of the announcement um 
Yeah, you know, what else are they going to spend their venture money on than these highly expensive podcasts? Because you know how much this costs to make. Oh, right now, yeah. we, this probably costs a million dollars today. So, yeah, just today, just this 30 yeah, minutes. People don't that, know that. That Michael and I did. <laughs> yeah. Because the bits are encased in gold. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they travel first class. Right. <laughs> I ha I flew first class from upstairs to to here. And in, was it Elon Musk powered technology? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, it was or Boeing or actually. Was but or blue so what what is, is it, I always want to think Bezos Space Company's Blue Steel. Blue Origin. I, but I know Blue Steel like, by the way they're bringing Mugatu back. Did you see that? Blue Blue Steel is the the look Bezos gives whenever SpaceX yeah. gets funded. That's By the way, do you know they're bringing out number 2? Of that movie, are are they? I'd heard well, something about that. Will Ferrell talked, and he said Mugato is going to be in the movie. So. Oh, fantastic! So. I love that that's hilarious. All right. Well, we're just we just stick around after the show, as you probably remember, and just chat. But if you need to take off, take off whenever. Well, I need to ask what is the what is the average time someone sticks around because it's uh, kind they, of a mystery. It's, it's like, either it's it's zero to zero to to full. Right. Either people just take off right after the show is done and then then Jenny and I just chat with the audience or if they stick around, usually people stick around the whole way, which we're usually out of here by two fifteen, two twenty. In the audience in the chat room, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then, yeah, Jenny and I usually just chat about whatever random things are coming to our head while I'm editing. Usually okay. not about technology. Mostly I divert it to things like movies and television. Yeah, I thought you were going to jump in there on the uh, Zoolander thing. <laughs> no, because I'm still writing the show notes. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're like, no, I, actually, I'm working. <laughs> I'm working. Just working. I mean, is it me? I was a huge Zoolander. I, yeah, I mean, I I'm, a big, I'm a big Ben Stiller fan. So. Yeah. Did you see Secret Life of Walter Mitty? I haven't. Yes. I did. It was much better than I thought it was going to be. By Same here. Lot. Yeah. And I thought he was, I was skeptical of him in what's essentially a straight role uh, and Kristen Wiig in what is pretty much a, a, a straight role. And they both nailed it. I thought it was fun, really good. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, he, he feels like the kind of guy. He's almost a, he's a little bit Woody Allen-ish, right? He's kind of that kind of guy to me. Like, he yeah. a lot of different types of roles. He is the ser most serious funny guy out there. Sure. Like even his even his comedy always goes to straight man in some version of. You're right. He's That's a really good point. Man. Yeah, and I I guess I should have thought. Well, if he's good at a straight man, he should be good. At Did you hear his interview with uh, Mark Maron on WTF? Mm -mm. No, I haven't. On a Peter WTF and like that's I a great am. one. That's a great one. That was the first podcast I ever listened to. With any regularity, that's not, not that, Tom. That's no, oh. that's that's how you tell someone's After podcasting Tom. generation. Jenny yep. is of the newer podcasting yep. generation, and then like and before the that, I don't the, the comedy generation. Tom, what was your first podcast like outside of like you know anything you were involved with? What was like the one you kind of subscribed to? I believe it was Coverville. It was either Coverville or Jawbone Radio. It was one of those two. Those were the first two that I had. Uh, and then I also listened to one called Drive or watched one called Drive Time, which was a guy doing a video podcast in 2006. Wow. Actually, it might have been 2005 uh, from his car. Was it called I Drive Slowly? No, it's just it just had the camcorder set up on his dash, and then he would record himself uh, talking wow. while he drove, and every once in a while he'd have guests. Who would get in the passenger That's seat? That's awesome. The yeah. Guest. So he basically he preceded Jerry, Jerry, Jerry comedians in cars getting. Popped. Yeah, yeah. It was random guy in car. Um. So has anyone ever done the Where Are They Now podcasting edition? That's a great idea, though. No, I doubt it. I haven't heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, like find like the ten original podcasts that everybody listened to and find out what they're all doing now. I mean, I could tell you one's really easy. Brian Ibbett is doing the morning stream, but uh, and he's still doing Coverville too. Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, but uh, I just uh, I, I was just thinking about that, like you know how they occasionally look back on all the old, old YouTube stars and right, right. I don't know. No, I geek out a little bit sometimes when I think about the fact that I regularly hang out with Brian Ibbett 
on shows <laughs> and Len Peralta is on my show every Friday. And those were my, I, those, those guys were some were famous to me before I ever met them. That's cool. That's always yeah. cool when you kind of meet people that you love their stuff and you get to know them a little bit later. <laughs> um, I felt like that with Ohm. So like, I, you know, I started reading Ohm like in 2005, 2006. So it was weird to actually go work at Gig Ohm. Oh yeah. Cause he was yeah, really yeah. like, Maybe the granddaddy of tech bloggers, right? He's there in 2004, 2005. Oh, definitely. Yeah. One of them for sure. What are we going to call this show, Jenny? Oh, yeah. Hold on. It's like a four-way tie. Yeah. Um, I actually like cold web sauce. Yeah, I kind of like that one too. I'm now you, are, you crowds, are you crowdsourcing these? Yeah, showbot.replex.org. Uh, El Khalif in our chat room created this for us. It allows people in the chat room to do a uh, bang S to submit a title idea at any time during the show. And then they can go to that page and vote on everybody else's ideas. I'm reading from the bottom up. Everyone Unsafe at any rad is actually very nader, nader full of nader goodness. Mm-hmm. Something about cold web sauce just appeals to me. So Tom, you got to tell me: is your is your novella? Does it have any science fiction elements, or is it pure straight mystery? Um, no, it doesn't have any science fiction elements, really. This one, because I've noticed a lot of mystery writers. I mean, I read a lot of mystery. There's a lot of cross genre now than there used mm-hmm. to be, a lot more than there used to be. So you see, you know, big writers going into fantasy elements, and you see them bringing science fiction elements and. I just, I've noticed that Blake Crouch is one of the, the guys who's big on Amazon, like uh, as a self publisher guy, he mixes it all up and he started with straight thrillers. Uh, but it's, it's just interesting. I think his, his, his science fiction series, it's a, it's a three part series got licensed by Fox and it's going to debut in 2015. Is oh, cool. Yeah, this show. is, I guess this is more fantasy since the, the, the main characters are unacknowledged dogs. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, But it doesn't have any other science fiction. Oh, iPhone not included just leaped to the top. I got to figure out the title before I, because I can't do anything more on my, on my editing until I do. Um, I think, let me look again. iPhone not included. Yeah, that's, that's to the main topic too. Yeah. All right. You win, 40 Thieves. Very good. Does he, does he get anything, like a t-shirt? He gets self-satisfaction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the knowledge of a title well-crafted. <laughs> yeah, we need interns. And then we could start doing things like giving away t-shirts and stuff. Mm-hmm. We also need more T-shirts. <laughs> we also need T-shirts. Well, t-shirt. Fine, fine. That's a very good point. I think if you <laughs> if you give like the, you get one title, you get something like a virtual that they come up. Do you ever had repeat title givers? Like, oh yeah, if you definitely. like the superstars need to get like, like it's an it's a affinity Although program. It can it can get a little ugly if people That's start true. winning That's a true. lot, you know, and then they're they're getting stuff like you know. You know when people start to hack Showbot? <laughs> <laughs> I need yeah. that coffee mug. Decals. Yeah, maybe like just every time you get a, uh, you could just have a, we could just give out an image that says, I picked the title for episode blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm, like a badge. Yeah, like a badge. Like a badge. That's what I was like looking for. Badge. That was the word I couldn't think of. But, uh, 40 Thieves again, says, I feel very satisfied. So there you go. Yeah. But then again, I would have to then go back and look at everyone who won a title and give them a badge. And that would, that would be... Nope. You can't, you're not retroactive. It'd have nope. to be no, like... Yep. Right. There is no retroactive because yeah. it all zaps away. It's too much work. We'll start it on January 1st, 2015. Yeah. <laughs> be like the new thing yeah. for 2015. You're like, you're like, thanks, Mike. Thanks for creating more work. Yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot, man, with your good ideas. Damn it. <laughs> All right, guys. It's been fun. All I'm right. going to head All out. Right. Thanks, Michael. Oh. Great always, talking to you. See you guys. Cheers. Wait, what is an update to the carrier settings for your iPhone is available? I'm already downloading the software. Do I also have to update the carrier settings? What carrier are you on? 
AT and T. Yeah, that's just that's just that might just be a random coincidence. But every once in a while, carriers will update their settings so that they make it more efficient for you to connect. It's weird. Oh, TVZ Gun says it's tracked in the wiki. The uh, the people who have oh, won. they're so awesome. Yeah, everything is tracked. Actually, we could probably entrust someone with the distribution of the badges. Mm -hmm. I know someone who makes really great, well, uh, decals, but that's mm -hmm. people mailing. I know that person, too. Isn't that amazing? I have that decal on my wallet, on my uh, computer. I have decal everywhere. I like this idea of giving out a badge if we can make yeah. it uh, efficient like well, that. We were going to give out a badge for news from you. We did. We did it for the first one. We didn't do it for the second one. Oh, right. Yeah. We had a nice little news from you badge that Lynn. Yeah. On the first episode of news from you, we did it. I remember that. Yeah. Forgot. Yep, all yep. Yep. All right. What am I doing? What am I doing? I got my notes all ready to go. I got my notes all ready to go. Hello, iOS 8. How are you? Oh, yeah. I guess I can start upgrading my iPad here. What if it permanently breaks? Well, that would be sad. I guess yeah. I will be researching uh, Android soundboards if that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, location. Yes, fine. Oh, now I have to get this thing out again. You know, enough with the password. Are we just like, this is you the ambient sounds of someone installing iOS 8. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, all right, fine. I will now go get my very super complicated iPhone, Apple password that you made me do all leak through. I didn't make you do no, anything. No, I, the the Apple. I'm referring to Apple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, all right, now this is another step. P and I can't even access uh, my password keeper on my phone, so I have to type it in like a dumb. <sighs> Technology. Verifying the update. Woo! Live iOS 8 installation videos on YouTube. Check them fascinating out. Fascinating stuff, people. We'll clip this out and it'll go viral. Make a podcast out of it. <laughs> oh man, I was uh, my friend uh, Russ Pitts, from, mm -hmm. formerly of Polygon, yeah. uh, was in town and we were having dinner last night, and uh, I saw this uh, email about PewDiePie turns his podcast into exclusive for MLG TV, and I just uh. started ranting. I was like. It's not a podcast, then, if it's an exclusive video on MLG.TV. It's an exclusive video on MLG.TV. Like, I get, but it, what, it had been a podcast, so I, I get what they were saying. But Formerly a, a podcast, now Right, a TV now show. an exclusive on MLG.TV. And the bigger story, anyway, is that this is YouTube's biggest star doing a deal right. with somebody who's not YouTube, right? So that, it is a legit story. tired of being taken advantage of. Well, I don't know. That sounds a little hypey to me. No, you're I mean, right. He's I'm not. Sorry. He's not canceling his YouTube channel. I think he's just being a smart businessman and saying, and like, "Hey, his audience yeah, base. totally." I never got over the uh, percentages there. <laughs> Something I never recovered from. No, I wrote it wrong. Oh, uh, uh, the password. Yeah. This is the problem with the gigantic. Just say it out loud while you type it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people could literally actually watch my mouth move and figure out what my concern is. That's it's not that, good. This is terrible. This is probably something I should do while you're, we're not on the At least air. cover, it's like a credit card terminal. You should cover it. Like or like a baseball pitcher, you know? Right, right. You just got to, here, you got to do this. <laughs> Hold on, I'm typing my password in. <laughs> Terrible. I gotta do this later. I'm not gonna do this now. Oh well, I was all excited to like reveal iOS 8 and now I'm still entering. Alright. Um. What am I waiting for? I don't think Where I'm waiting, waiting for anything. For? I th oh, I'm waiting for myself to publish the post. 
Yeah, That's dude. what I'm waiting for. And yeah, then I need that. to view the post and make sure that I didn't screw up the file. I screwed up one small thing every day when you were away. One yep. thing every day. It's amazing. It was like clockwork. Yep, file's fine. File's working. Okay. Yay. All right, I am out of the post. Woo. Okay. And we should get out of your face, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, so that Jenny can go finish putting in her password without you. Can't you tell if that's a number or a letter. That's different. Oh, man. All right. Uh, bye, everybody. We'll talk bye, to you tomorrow. Bye, everybody.